Um, welcome to this jointly organised session between SIUC and Scotland's Climate Assembly. I'm very excited about uh, introducing this session and we've got over 80 participants and I understand that the sessions are being recorded, certainly the plenary sessions, so I hope that everyone is comfortable um, with that. So this is important. This is important for a number of different reasons. The first is that um, Scotland's Climate Assembly laid um, their findings to the Parliament in June. And I think Susie Townsend is going to speak a little bit more about the details of, of, the, um, of the recommendations coming from that assembly group. It's also important in terms of timing because this is following on from COP26 in Glasgow. And regardless of one's personal or political views in COP26, I think there's something fundamental happened. And this was summed up quite uh, neatly by Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England in the Reith Lectures, when he said, this is an opportunity to align our personal values with what we value. And I think there's a moment in time where I think um, those values are going to shine through and become important for us as a society and, and for Scotland more generally. So um, I'm not going to dwell on, on, on many of the details, but I do want to make a couple of uh, introductory comments following on from COP. Clearly, there's been a lot of activity around, uh, around COP26, uh, uh, many areas that are going to be covered. Today, we're going to be a little bit more focused, and we're going to be focusing on, uh, on land use, we're going to be focusing on, uh, on biodiversity, we're going to be focusing on policy, and we're going to be focusing on food systems. These are really, really important issues and sit at the epicenter of many of the things that are facing society today. Not least if we consider land use and the future of land use, the structure around ownership of land, trade, all of these things will not only affect carbon sequestration, but they'll also affect the net zero economy and also um, a just transition. So these are really, really important issues. We've got some fantastic speakers, three of my colleagues, Davy McCracken, um, Mads Fischer-Moller and Stevie Thompson, who are going to speak to many of these uh, many of these points. I'm really looking forward to the conversations and your engagement in the breakout sessions that will follow. Just one other observation, I think, which um, uh, from a personal perspective, having worked internationally, I also think that it's, it's really important that we can cascade and translate global questions into uh, local solutions. So there's a, also an issue here about how we develop local uh, um, uh, solutions to some of the big challenges um, that we face. So um, I think I'm going to uh, conclude there. I'm looking forward to the session. I think I'm going to turn to um, to Susie to, to um, uh, uh, take us forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Wayne. And yes, I'm Susie Townend and I head the Secretariat for Scotland's Climate Assembly. And thank you very much indeed to the team at Scotland's Rural College for all their help in organising this event, and especially to Jane and Gemma. I'm now going to give you just a very brief introduction to the Assembly and its recommendations, starting with an overview from two of our members, Maya and David. And just bear with me while I um, share their contribution. Hello, my name is David. I am a 71 year old retired glass region. Hi, I'm Maya, I'm 10 and I live in the Highlands. Older people grew up thinking that climate emergency was something far off into the future. If we thought of it at all, it's my reality now. We all have a responsibility to tackle it. I've never known a time when the climate emergency didn't threaten my future. I can't see a world without it. It's something me and my friends are growing up with. People from all walks of life were brought together as a mini Scotland to agree how the country needs to change to tackle the climate emergency. We examined the best evidence and found common ground on a way forward. Already we are seeing the harmful effects of climate change in Scotland and around the world. Temperature rises, extreme weather, damage to plants and animals under rivers and oceans, threats to our food supply. There's so much waste in how we do things at the moment. That needs to change now. This needs to go much further than just a bit of household recycling. We need immediate action to bring down Scotland's carbon emissions. 
it can't just be down to us as individuals. We need everyone to pull together. Government, businesses and communities across Scotland. We need big changes. Changes to how we work, how we travel, how we build our buildings, how we heat our homes. We can make big changes right now. Changes to how our public services are run, how we make sure we all understand the climate emergency, how we use our land, how our communities are connected, how our businesses work. We can make a better Scotland by making these changes together. It's time for Scotland to take the lead in tackling the global climate emergency. Scotland's Climate Assembly has laid down a mandate from ordinary citizens for immediate action. We can make a difference. We can make a difference. So there we are. That was um, David and Myers, just a brief summary of what the Citizens Assembly was about. Um, but I'm going to just share my screen again and show you just a few slides that just talk through in a little bit more detail um, what the Assembly is about. And hopefully um, you can see that fine. Give me a shout if you can't. So what is a Citizens Assembly? What makes it different to a consultation? It's a demographically representative group of members who are given time and opportunity to learn, then they deliberate before making recommendations. Members bring their own lived experience to bear together with the evidence they hear. This gives their decisions weight and legitimacy. So obviously it's very important that they really are, in this case, a mini Scotland, as you see here. So those were the criteria in which we selected our members. And this is a question which members were asked to answer. How should Scotland change to tackle the climate emergency in an effective and fair way? So you can see that we're already building in the ideas that there does have to be change and that there is a climate emergency and the concepts of effectiveness and fairness. As I said, members learned from experts as part of the process. The evidence base was balanced and comprehensive with over 100 speakers presenting to the Assembly over seven weekends. Members spent some time in three streams, one on diet, land use and lifestyle, which we'll particularly focus on today, also one on homes and communities, and one on travel and work. But they all came back together to share what they had learned, and all members, just over 100 people, voted on the final recommendations. There have been similar assemblies in other parts of the world, including Denmark, Germany and France, but the involvement of children through work with Children's Parliament has been unique to Scotland's Climate Assembly. And you'll see their calls of action throughout the Assembly report and they tend to have an, an orange heading on them when you see them on some of the later slides. So our report was laid in Parliament in June with 81 recommendations. And now we're waiting for the Scottish Government to formally respond it. Um, the, the Assembly came out of the Climate Change Act and requires the, the Scottish Government legally to respond within six months of the report being made. There were, um, as I said, 81 recommendations and a large number of those have been on agriculture, land use and the food system. And you can see most of them on the screen now. I realise some of you might be looking at them on quite small screens. Um, so there is a special prize for those of you that can see the deliberate error where we've actually duplicated one of the recommendations on this slide. Um, I'm going to leave that slide on just while I um, introduce you to the three speakers that we have um, today who I'm delighted are going to talk about recommendations in a bit more detail and particularly about how they could be implemented and by whom. So first of all, um, I'm delighted we've got Professor David McCracken, who's Head of Department at the Integrated Land Management at SRUC, and is also Head of SRUC's Hill and Mountain Research Centre near Creanaric, which I think is his background on the slide just now. And he's going to focus on recommendations relating to land use and biodiversity. The Assembly's recommendations in this area are based on encouraging land and sea to be used in a way that supports our climate change ambition and recognises that action that is good for climate is often good for biodiversity too. 
Recommendations range from insisting brownfield options that are explored thoroughly before allowing development on agricultural land, to setting targets for peatland and native woodland restoration, to introducing a land tax that would penalise land use that resulted in carbon emissions rather than carbon capture. So we'll, we'll, we'll move to Davy shortly, but after that, we'll hear from Stephen Thompson, who is an agricultural economist with almost 30 years of experience in applied agricultural policy analysis and rural research. He's been involved in assessing future support options in Wales, as well as bringing immense knowledge of the Scottish agricultural policy context. So he is very well able to bring particular insights to the members' recommendation that post CAP farming should be developed in such a way that it encourages farmers to transition to more sustainable land practices. Members wanted this to be fully implemented in the next five years, so very different support policy to the one that we've previously had. And our final speaker is Mads fischer moller Mads is Professor in Food Policy at SRUC and was previously Senior Advisor for Food Policy at the Nordic Council of Ministers and has also acted as policy advisor to the Danish government on nutrition. The recommendations that members made on food recognise that the diet we eat has a huge climate impact, even though individuals may not be aware of this. Members recommended a number of approaches, from public information campaigns to increase awareness of the climate contribution of diet, to then making it easier for people to make climate friendly choices through carbon labelling of food, combined with a food carbon tax and subsidy proposal with revenue being used to subsidise sustainable foods. And finally, targets for public sector canteens to procure low carbon food and supermarkets to sell local produce. So I'll stop sharing my slides now and pass first to Professor David McCracken, who's going to focus on land use and biodiversity. David. Thanks, Susie. I'll just share my screen. <laughs> Can uh, someone just confirm that you can see my screen okay? Yes, okay. we can, David. Right, thank you very much. Um, afternoon, folks. As um, Susie said, I've been asked to talk about the recommendations um, around soil and land management practices coming from the Climate um, Assembly report. Um, just by way of um, context, and many of you have probably seen these stripe diagrams before. So these are um, average, annual, average annual temperatures from around um, 1884 through until up about 2018, I think from this particular screenshot. Where it's red, that's where the average temperature has been a lot higher than the long-term average. And hopefully you can see from that, that the red, uh, particularly in the last sort of 20 years, we are, within, uh, we are um, already undergoing climate change in Scotland. Within SRUC, myself, my team and a whole host of others, we do a lot of work looking at agricultural practices and how you can change those ag agricultural practices to actually mitigate some elements of um, emissions um, from uh, agriculture. Um, but the point of this slide is to say that even by doing that, and by doing that will be important, um, it is only going to get agriculture so far down the line of reaching net zero by 2045. We need to have a lot more additional land use change, land management change, uh, land management practice change, uh, particularly with, within um, biodiversity management, and peatland restoration, woodland creation, in order to actually stand any chance of reaching net zero by 2045. Um, Susie has already outlined that the, uh, the recommendations that I'm talking about today uh, all have the goal of developing work, training, volunteering opportunities to support those net zero targets, particularly through connecting people with nature, rebuilding depleted natural resources and, and increasing biodiversity. Um, these are the four that I'm going to be talking to, but I'll talk about each of these in turn, so no need to um, view each of you or read every single one of these on the, on the slides as they stand. I'll, I'll, I'll recreate them um, on the next slide. So just looking at reducing um, um, carbon, uh, so making sure um, or seeking to ensure that Scottish grown produced materials are um, used in house construction, uh, and uh, increasing the use of carbon neutral materials. I'm just hesitant a wee bit. Somebody started to draw on my screen and I don't know how they've actually done that. But anyway, we can ignore that for now. Um, background to that is many of you might be aware that if, con if the concrete industry 
um, was a country, then it would be the third highest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world um, after um, China and the USA. Um, here in Scotland, um, homegrown timber actually, or here in the UK, homegrown timber is actually used for about 33, a third of the UK market for construction. Um, but in general, UK imports around 80% of its timber needs um, every year. And so we need to take that sort of the scale of um, and the ask uh, into account. And um, the map here is a map of land capability for agriculture in Scotland, with the purple being um, what we call rough grazing, the sort of the mountainous, more remote um, and challenging areas um, of Scotland. Um, and we need to think carefully if we are going to markedly increase the use of homegrown timber, actually, where do we do it? What type of timber are we producing? Um, what scale are we doing it at? Is it large scale forestry as we currently actually have from a productive softwood perspective? Um, and is it only for timber production or do we want to actually, as I would argue, have more biodiversity, biodiversity and other social gains um, out there? There's certainly a, a role, a scope for more large scale softwood production and planting and production in, in Scotland. But I think we do need to sort of step back a little and ask the question, um, what do we want um, from our sort of woodland and forestry environments into the future? Um, uh, uh, a document, A New Vision for Land Use in Scotland, produced by the Scottish Ecological Design um, Association, said CEDA, um, earlier this year that I was involved with, highlighted that we also need to actually move towards much more in the way of mixed use. Um, developments for living and working and examples were given having, having um, sustainable housing workshops and regenerative woodlands all occurring together in the same space to allow much more of the more of those interchanges to actually happen and we need to give more thought through an industrial policy for wood and a roadmap um, to actually um, highlight where do we want what type of growth both in softwood and hardwood um, do we want in the future and how can we link that to wider economic growth and additional um, uh, business and job opportunities going forward. The other aspect about peatland um, restoration and woodland creation then um, the assembly were keen that the government um, committed to um, higher levels um, of targets uh, than um, they currently actually have it's worthwhile remembering that our current targets for peatland restoration, so the purple in the map is where all our peatlands occur in Scotland, with 80% of them being degraded, about 2 million hectares in total. Targets are 250,000 hectares restored by 2030, 600,000 hectares restored by 2045, which are, we, you know, which are quite high targets. Um, and given that we're starting, we well, have started from a relatively low base. And for woodland distribution, um, we're currently at 18% of woodland in Scotland. Uh, there's an aspiration to get to 20% of land under trees and woodland by 2032. Uh, and a staged way of getting there, we're currently looking at um, 12,000 to 15,000 hectares um, at the current point in time. But by 2024-25, Scottish Government want us to be, want us to be um, establishing 18,000 hectares per year um, of new woodland. Um, and uh, as we've seen at COP, these sort of nature-based solutions have featured more heavily at COP than in, than in previous years. But for, with regard to sort of COP in general and these nature-based solutions in particular, actually having the target is all very well, but it's actually achieving that target and, and, and having the outcome um, being achieved that it's actually going to be key. So I would suggest that from a peatland perspective, key, key questions are where um, amongst that um, um, Two million hectares of, of peatland. Where do we actually prioritise um, the uh, restoration in order to get more bang for our peatland restoration buck? And what type of woodland, as I've already said, what scale do we actually um, um, establish it at? What what are the general purposes we want for it? Uh, and for both of those aspects, how do we engage with land managers? How do we integrate management of peatlands and woodlands more into existing land management practices? But because only by doing that will we get any real um, movement towards any of these targets um, in this time scales that we actually need. Looking at um, planning decisions, uh, again, the assembly was keen that um, local authorities and planning departments built in um, climate change and biodiversity and um, human well-being more clearly into their planning decisions, particularly for urban areas um, and buildings. Again, the, 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 the CEDA, Scottish Ecological Design Association document, highlighted as background that 
uh, we need to actually have much more in the way of green spaces within urban and suburb suburban settings in order to actually improve human well-being. And that document also highlighted the need for a sustainable place making and mending strategy. We need to focus on place and what needs to be done in each individual place to achieve these sort of multiple benefits. Um, and just to highlight, um, currently just came out of 10 days ago, uh, there's a consultation ongoing by Scottish Government with regard to the fourth national planning framework. Um, and within that, uh, the, there is the suggestion that actions can be regionalised uh, or priorities can be regionalised across Scotland in order to actually move that planning framework forward. Um, and I suppose a key question for the Climate Assembly and others is, does what's planned in that consultation, does it meet the need um, of the aspirations from, from Climate Assembly? And then finally, um, the Climate Assembly highlighted the desire, the need to actually have a national nature service supplemented by a conservation volunteers scheme. Um, and again, education and training, um, particularly for, with regard to the green economy, has been highlighted by CEDA, has high been highlighted by Nature Scott in their Skills Action Plan, features strongly um, in terms of um, uh, developing education and training programs and going forward as far as organisations like SRUC uh, and others are concerned. But I suppose my observation would be a national nature service sounds nice in principle, but it really needs to be not seen in isolation, or it won't be effective if it is um, seen in isolation. It needs to be embedded within a wider suite of actions to produce a much more climate and nature conscious workforce within Scotland, and a suite of actions that are also ensuring that those individuals can be upskilled, reskilled um, in these green areas, but there's also um, uh, real job opportunities or volunteer volunteering opportunities arising as they go forward. So I would suggest that much greater thought is needed not to why such a national nature service might be might be um, beneficial, but how it can be embedded in a much more holistic approach to education and training and achieving a green recovery across Scotland as a whole. That was all I wanted to say, Susie. I don't know how I've done for time, but I'll stop stop sharing my screen now. Thank you very much indeed. Excellent. Um, thank you very much indeed for that. I'm going to move next on to Stephen Thompson for his presentation, and then we'll take um, questions from um, the, the audience for each of the presenters at the end before we go into our breakout rooms. So if you do have a question for Davy, if you could hold on to it for the moment, and we'll, we'll take the questions um, after we've heard from the next two speakers. So I'm delighted that our next speaker is Stephen Thompson, also from SRUC, who's going to focus on future agricultural support and policy. Thank you very much, Stephen. The floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, can somebody confirm? Yeah, we can see your screen. Thank you very much. Good. Uh, I just need, need to work out, because I'm on dual screen, how to transition, that's it. Um, so thanks very much for the opportunity to speak today. And I suppose um, just the, the, the initial pictures in the front here is to remind us that agriculture comes in all shapes and sizes across Scotland, uh, delivering multiple uh, things in terms of food, biodiversity provisioning, uh, carbon sequestration, but also leads to emissions, pollution, et cetera. Uh, so, so one, one uh, size fits all policies don't work. Um, and the common agricultural policy has been criticised uh, more recently because of that approach. I want to take us back to the transitions in terms of climate change, and this is the latest um, set of figures from the National Inventory. And you can see the, the position of agriculture, it's fallen by 13% uh, since 1990. Um, land, use, uh, land use change in forestry, which is the, the other part of the inventory, which of course embeds agriculture. Uh, has fallen by 70% decline. Um, and that's largely because trees have matured that were planted in the 80s and are now sequestering carbon rather than emitting from their planting, etc. And the, the key thing here is that our energy sector has, has performed wonderfully in reducing emissions. And what that's meaning is the balance is pushing uh, agriculture and land use further and further up the agenda in terms of the total percentage. So if we go back six or seven years 
uh, agriculture and land use was at 14%. Now it's at 22% of Scotland's emissions. And, and it's, a, it's the real wake-up call that the industry actually has to they actually has to address uh, these emissions and actually work out how to reduce their footprint uh, as we go forward. And of course, um, in the in the the assembly recommendations, um, the children's parliament uh, they, they basically said introduce a Pagovian tax, which is a tax on all negative externalities, things that are bad. Um, and of course, the the, the main uh, assembly talked about a carbon land tax. But of course, if you introduce a carbon land tax uh, at the same time as you're supporting the land use sector through uh, through policy intervention, then you give it with one hand and take it away with another, which seems a bit of a, a strange a strange policy mix to me. That's not to say there's not a scope, scope for regulation here. So Davy talked about peatland restoration, uh, and at some stage the government may introduce regulatory uh, enforcement of peatland restoration uh, if they're not getting success with with the, the normal mechanisms. The um, the key um, recommendations and goals. The goals are quite clear. Uh, balance the needs of the environment, landowners and communities across Scotland for sustainable land use that achieves emission reductions. I, I don't think I've spoken to anybody that would disagree with that in the last five years, uh, including, well, including within the farming industry. And then if you look at the business, the recommendations on business, uh, they also are really useful because remember farms and crofts are businesses as well. And it support long-term sustainable business models where people in the environment are considered the poor profit and the carbon footprint of working practices are reduced. And again, I think there's becoming a, more, a greater realization that, uh, that, that we have a responsibility to society and the, and the wider population in the globe. The Children's panel, uh, Parliament, uh, they talked about uh, only allowing sustainable ways of farming, uh, that you uh, only include natural fertilisers, etc. And uh, that then means, well, could, could, should we plough land? Um, because that is the most sustainable way is you go to a zero tillage uh, mechanisms uh, that then may have other consequences further down the line. The, 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 there was a recommendation about farming sub subsidies and transition. I'll come on to that very shortly, but that aligns perfectly with what's been happening within the Scottish government and with industry. But the, the, the issue is it's how to make that next step to actually delivering it rather than talking about how it might be designed and what it needs to achieve. Incentivizing cooperative models of land use. Um, and again, I think there are quite a lot of examples where it already occurs, where uh, woodland is integrated with agriculture, uh, where, where the, there's more landscape type approaches. Uh, but that is really down to the individual landowners and land managers. And it's how do you actually incentivize this to uh, occur at a far greater uh, scale and extent. And then the Children's Parliament also picked up on the on. A recommendation about uh, banning hunting. And I would just caution against that because we have a, a red deer problem in this country. We're going to have a roe deer problem in lowlands at some stage if we, if we are changing agricultural uh, production, which means then that you need to have hunting in order to manage those uh, populations so that they don't cause environmental damage to peatlands, etc. And if we look at the, the land use change, Davies talked about the peatland uh, aspect of it. This year saw a change in the methodology and how land use emissions were calculated. And it, it flipped land use change and uh, land use, land use change in forestry from, from a net sink of carbon, i.e. it sequestered more carbon that it was releasing to a net, uh, a net source of emissions. And you can see up here what they were the, at the top where the emissions are coming from, grassland converted to cropland. That's a thing a lot of people forget when they talk about let's move away from a livestock diet or a, a, a meat diet towards a, an increase in, in uh, plant-based products. It's when we actually till land, we're releasing carbon. So we have to be careful about that. And the big change has been on peatlands and actually where we've got agricultural activity happening on old peatlands uh, and, and, and the emissions coming out of degraded peatland as Davy, ta Davy talked about. The, the key question there is how do we actually mobilize this action? 
uh, because th th there are quite strong incentives through the, the peatland carbon crowd and through things like peatland action, which is a government incentive to restore peatland, but we can't get enough bodies on the ground to do it. It's the same with trees. There seems to be a resistance in some areas to actually planting trees uh, and integrating trees with farmland. And how do we overcome that mindset uh, that, or, or, or deliver that mindset change that's required? If you move on to the agricultural inventory, we know that the suckler beef, the beef herd, uh, is, is responsible for about 40% of the emissions. Uh, arable sector, your cropping sector, about 30% of the agricultural emissions. And you can look at that whole envelope. By 2032, the agriculture sector has to lose a third of its emissions by the, through the Climate Change Action Plan. And the, there are real concerns as to how you actually do that. If you look at the, the, the baseline of all of this, enteric methane, the, the gut, the burping of cows, and sheep, it accounts for 50%. So we need methods to reduce methane. There are new technologies coming through in terms of methane inhibitors. Uh, they can reduce the amount of methane that an animal produces. And then colleagues in SRUC at the Green Cow Facility are looking at ways at where they can identify animals that actually are low methane productive or, or, or low methane emitters. And actually, if we can select for them, and actually start breeding from them, then we actually breed the, breed the solution uh, over time. But farmers also have a lot of the, the tools in their own hand. Uh, if you look at the livestock data, we know that there are poor performers within the industry. We know there's higher mortality rates on some farms. We know that some farms have fertility problems. These are all things that the farmer has got in control of himself. And if we just incentivize them to actually deliver uh, more technically efficient solutions, then we can get there or part of the way there. So then if you think about COP, the great white hope for uh, emissions and agriculture emissions reduction, um, agriculture didn't really play a big part in a lot of the discussions. And I think next COP in Africa, it will probably play a far bigger part uh, give it, given the, the, the need in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa and places like that for, for change. What came out of it from agriculture? Well, the four per thousand initiative. That's an initiative uh, to talk about increasing soil carbon in our, uh, the, the carbon content of our soils by 0.04% per annum. Uh, Scottish government have announced that they've signed up to this initiative that started in, in, uh, in Paris 2021. Um, and then there's a policy action agenda for transition to sustainable food and agriculture. UK government have signed up to this with a number of countries uh, where they're going to actually prioritise research and development and actually try and develop new solutions uh, for agriculture. And of course, the one that we all heard most about was methane, the methane pledge, and the, 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 the promise to reduce methane emissions by 30% by 2030. And that is the one that affects Scottish agriculture the most, because uh, if I remember back, back uh, methane from, from the agriculture sector is half our emissions. Policy has been moving, uh, and some would say it's not been moving fast enough. Brexit occurred, and, and this was the, 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 the crux of the issue, is Brexit occurred and there was a decision within the industry, within Scottish government, of stability and simplicity. And there was a promise, a political promise to maintain payments uh, and the, the status quo up until 2024. And it's been pretty hard to break that. But in between that, that time in 2020, uh, 2017, uh, and now we've had the climate uh, emergency, we've had the biodiversity emergencies declared, uh, and that has led a number of farmer-led groups, including the independent uh, Farming for 1.5 Degrees panel, uh, and also the, the government-appointed Farming and Food Production Future, food, future Policy Group to be set up. And then the recent, more recent farmer-led groups uh, trying to take forward uh, ideas from within the sector as to how you would remiss, reduce emissions and also uh, address biodiversity provisioning. Uh, the National Farmers Union, uh, along with myself and uh, my collaborator, Andrew Moxie, tried to summarise all of this into a document and give suggestions as to where we could go. And there is now this uh, Agricultural Farm Implementation Oversight Board uh, that are meant to be informing government and working with government as to some of the solutions. Throw into the mix the, the manifesto or the policy uh, agreement between the Greens, 
Green Party and the SNP, which has given a, a, an added impetus uh, for some of this. Can the ambitions that the, the Assembly have set out be achieved? I wholeheartedly think so. It's about design. It's about incentivizing change. We know from history that farmers will follow where the, the support mechanisms are. And if we make the, the condition that the, the, the bulk of their support, having increased conditions on greenhouse gas emissions and on biodiversity provisioning, then we can go an awful long way, long way there. We will need transitional support though. They need knowledge exchange support. They need advisory support and they will need some capital support to take them there. And it's, it's a complex, complex beast uh, is agricultural policy because it's trying to deliver on multiple fronts. So if we just want to reduce emissions, we can reduce livestock from certain areas that has biodiversity issues. It also affects food chain issues. Uh, and of course, there's the ambition 2030 to increase food production or the output from food in Scotland uh, to 30 billion by 2030. And where will the ambition uh, be delivered? Um, I think the government are starting to move uh, positively to where the, the Assembly have, have suggested they need to go. Um, the, they have introduced, they're, they're going to introduce a new uh, bill to Parliament in 2023. Now, the Assembly was talking about a five-year phase. If it goes in front of Parliament in 2023, it'll be the end of 2023, which means it'll be 25 before that policy comes in, 26 before payments actually hit the farmers' doors. So there's your six, six years, five, six year window before we actually see full policy reform. And that's just part of the cycle. Um, the government have committed to more than half of our funding being more conditional by 2024. And we're starting to see the, 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 in, the infancy of that coming through from the, the, the package, the, 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 the sustainable package or the transition package that was announced uh, two, two or three weeks ago, where they are going to have a, a test of conditionality. Farmers are going to be encouraged to uh, do some uh, baselining in terms of carbon and soil soil sampling, et cetera. And uh, through, the, through the Green Party, you've got things like the Nature Restoration Fund uh, is becoming a priority where there's going to be 13, 14 million pounds a year additional monies to spend on biodiversity. There is a bit of a spanner in the works though, in that uh, we still haven't an agreed framework at a UK level. The Scottish government want to align with the EU whilst we're within a UK framework and we have to comply with international trade rules about how we support agriculture. So it's an incredibly complex uh, topic, uh, but the Assembly uh, did highlight roughly where the industry has got itself just now. And I will uh, finish off there. Thank you very much indeed, um, Stephen. And just to, to remind everyone that we'll take questions for the speakers at the end. So I'm now going to pass to Professor Mads Fischer-Moller, who's going to focus on the food system and food policy. Um, and we can see your screen now, Mads. I don't know whether you want to hide the ones at the, at the side or if you want to nope, just do on um, that view. Do you hear me and see what you want to see? Excellent. That looks great. Thank great. you so much. Yeah, so thank you. I, I think I have one minute left, but I'll use a little bit more, but I'll try to make it as brief as I can. Uh, so if I can just, here we go. So we know that the, the food system is generating a lot of greenhouse gas emissions and I don't want to go to the details on the left. We can just see that climate isn't the only pl place where the food system is overshooting its planetary boundaries. The way we produce and the food we eat is causing tremendous harm to our planet, not just the climate, but also the biodiversity, as we heard from Professor Dam uh, from Dave McCracken and, and other. Uh, we're in out of balance on a number of issues, but climate is kind of like the emergency most, uh, most precious to us at the moment, perhaps also because it is threatening human extinction and not just other mammals. Uh, as we see on the right hand side, this is like the global overshoot of. of where we are in terms of what we ought to eat for our health and then uh, what we are actually eating globally. The good news is that it, what is good for our health is oftentimes also good for the planet. So we can uh, kind of like uh, 
have two strikes in one. If we solve uh, our bad food habits, it can both be good for the planet and for um, our health. We have a public health crisis as well, as I'm sure you all are well aware of. When Hi. you're working in... I'm so sorry to interrupt your um, slides are in note view. Are you okay to just switch your displays because it's quite small on the screen just now? Uh, okay, I'll try to see if I can figure it out. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, don't know how I got into that. Uh, hmm. If you go to display settings at the top, will it, will it let you switch the displays? I'm not sure how to do it. It's okay. Um, it's the, the middle top. Anyways, I'm sorry about that, everyone. Can you see it like this? Is that working? Yeah. Okay. I think it's fine. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so it can be really outrageous and you can be really unhappy with uh, food and working in, in, in food can make you both out, outraged and optimistic. So I'm outraged being at the, the climate conference and seeing that there's nothing about food or diet or anything about actually changing consumption patterns in the way we are discussing the climate emergency. There's even nothing about sustainable diets, food waste, or the way we interact with food in our everyday life when it comes to the national uh, the plans that our government is delivering in to solve the climate crisis. So food is not really there yet. On the other hand, you can be really, I can be really optimistic. Reading through the Scottish Climate Assembly report, it has food mentioned more than almost 100 times. So food is definitely there when it comes to how citizens are thinking about solving the climate crisis. We can also see... It's just a sign from the, from the uh, demonstrations. Veganism is also vegetarian. There's a lot of interest and a lot of energy in food and climate. So definitely it's part of the conversation. These are the recommendations, uh, and I'll go more in detail with them now. Uh, but we can just see the broadly supported food, carbon labeling, plant-based, low-carbon food, sustainable diet, uh, public information campaigns, and food carbon tax. So food carbon labeling is put by 95% in the uh, climate assembly. Would it work? Yes, it would. We know that. 35, uh, we, we've seen a couple of examples where, where food carbon labeling have been tested out. We can see that consumers are responding positively to it. Even the consumers who don't want the information actually change their habits once they get the information. Some early tests that I know of are also showing that this kind of labeling will actually reduce... Uh, in, uh, in consumption of the most emitting parts of or, or emitting products. Uh, it's definitely also needed. We, we just a recent poll from the club, uh, climate conference showed that only 18% of kind of like a, a global average, including some Scots, uh, believe that reducing meat consumption will actually have any climate effect at all. So people aren't like uh, carbon food uh, literate enough to actually know that their food choices matter. So a labeling can also just help with that. Is it doable? Uh, it depends. It's really hard to do to the level of detail that we usually want from a labeling scheme. Uh, well, a tomato might be better from Spain in the winter, but might be better from Scotland in the summer. A, a piece of, of steak from one cow can be vastly different in terms of carbon emissions than a, a piece of steak from another cow. So there's a lot of tension in building something like this. And, and I can understand as a former civil servant, why a, a minister wouldn't go and say, we, we will just do this because it's very, very easy to get criticism because you, it's really hard to do it to the level of detail that we usually do our labels on. So I, I would reckon that a labeling scheme would have to be quite broad and then it wouldn't account for all the fine nuances. And then if a Scottish farmer is like 8% better than his neighbor, he won't be rewarded. Uh, but it is on its way. We can see that governments, uh, EU is discussing it, governments in Holland, Germany is supporting it, and also other governments are discussing this. So it, would, it could work. Uh, it is needed, but it's really hard to do. Um, require governments and public savers to procure plant-based and low-carbon food. Would it work? Well, in a way. Uh, we know that only one to two 
50% of the uh, Scottish food market is actually public procurement. So it's not as though if we change public procurement, it will have a substantial impact on, on our emissions, but it will work in the, t in, 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 uh, in the way that it can show the leadership. It can show the government want to create a new food culture for Scotland that's more sustainable. And in that regard, it is needed. We have all in, in the food environment, there's probably not, well, the youth, they'll come in, they'll just have completely different food habits. But we can actually see once the youth start inhabiting the old food system, they adopt the old food habits. So if we want to change how food is perceived by consumers, it could be a good uh, tool to intervene early and show that food can be something different than what we're used to. Uh, a sustainable diet campaigns will it work probably not to be honest we've seen the uh, food standard scotland says despite our efforts there's been no real improvement in scottish diets the last 20 years so it's not as though we haven't done a lot of campaigning it's just not working uh, we can also see that the figure in the middle shows that uh, marketing and innovation is skewed heavily towards junk food so we can see of all the marketing uh, of food by far the most of it is by is for food high in, in fat, sugar, and salt, convenience food, and, and very high carbohydrate food. So we can already see that the marketing, the, the, the landscape is heavily tilted against what we actually ought to eat from a climate perspective. So a little bit of funding, uh, public funding for a campaign probably won't matter much. It is needed, but I think the better way of doing it is to have a, a, a public-private partnership around it where the public is able to set kind of like a, a, an ambitious new agenda and then work with the retailers to figure out how can they put more of their uh, marketing power into selling the right things because we don't have a good track record of having a uh, sustainable uh, or healthy diet campaigns working here in Scotland. Uh, food carbon tax, it's not as supported as the others. Would it work? most likely we don't really it's again it's really really hard to do because how how how, how fine detail would you go to should a, a, a scottish tomato be taxed differently in winter and summer uh, how do you distinguish between different farming practices so and again as we heard from stephen we are already subsidizing farming heavily through our, our agricultural subsidies so would we it would be like okay we're subsidizing one hand and we're taking away money with the other hand so it's a, it's kind of like a complicated uh, space to be in uh, i think we have better mechanisms but you can say it is definitely needed currently uh, meat is two to three times more uh, cheaper than its environmental footprint whereas veg, fruit and veg is only five to ten times cheaper uh, five to ten percent cheaper than its environmental footprint so the true cost of food isn't in the price uh, but is a is a tax the right way it's hard to do but it could be and it is on its way we can see germany and netherlands already supporting uh, eu level uh, tax on meat for instance the kitchen's recommendations are more system-wide they want accessible food they want uh, the good fresh organic food it's less detailed but it's probably more what we need no single uh, piece of legislation or not four pieces of legislation will help us make the right choices in an environment where we are just completely overwhelmed by junk food and a culture of of loving something that's not good for the planet so i think the kids recommendations that takes a more holistic systems approach is perhaps the right one we actually need to think the food side of things together with the agricultural side of things we need to make sure that what we fund from an agricultural subsidies will also be what's needed in the food system going forward. We can already see that big businesses are skewing their investments away from uh, some of the more carbon heavy foods towards uh, new uh, alternative foods. Are we perhaps being a little bit, we are not making, if we just keep supporting what we've been supporting uh, for a long time, we might end up uh, kind of like peeing our pants to keep warm. We might not be doing the good for the Scottish society in the long run. So I think having the kids' recommendations as a more systems transformational approach is perhaps the right one. Uh, so we need all hands on deck. It's complicated. It, it's not necessarily more climate friendly if it's Scottish. It's not necessarily, there's not necessarily an equation between climate friendly and healthy. 
but it can be done. We know that we can make a healthy, sustainable, and profitable food system, but we need to break with the junk food cycle and the invisibility of nature. So we need systems transformational policies to help us uh, do that. A lot of small things might be enough, but we need a lot of them. Thank you very much indeed, Mad. Um, that was really interesting and lots of um, food for thought there, if you'll pardon the pun. Um, we have about 10 minutes, just, just about five minutes left for our questions. Um, we've had a couple in the chat already. Um, and if you do want to ask a question, and if you just pop up your hand to so your electronic hand, then um, that would be great because then I'll be able to spot you. But we'll, we'll go first to Stephen McKenzie's question, who's um, asking about um, whether it would be possible to increase the uptake of forestry by looking at the regulations of um, and planting guidelines and particularly thinking about um, a sort of agroforestry approach. Stephen, do you want to add any more to my brief summary of your question? And then I think I'll ask Davy to come in and answer um, that initially. Stephen, do you want to say any more on, on your question? Uh, thank you. Um, I'll start my video too. Uh, no, it was really just um, just a thought. You know, there, there is huge scope for pastoral grazing in the uplands in particular, um, and, and it would give us an opportunity to encourage those um, landowners who haven't done any tree planting on their farms. And it may be just a first step to encourage them that trees aren't bad or the right trees in the right place aren't bad. Great. Thanks, Stephen. David, do you want to come in on that? Um, so just... Um two or three quick responses to that. Um, yes, there actually is um, um, grants for agroforestry currently available, but they're, they're too little and they're too restrictive. Um, there is a lot of discussion about agroforestry in Scotland and, and elsewhere and the need to actually do more or potentially the need to do to do more um, 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 with that for, um, for the reasons that, that, that Stephen has expressed. So there's a lot of discussion ongoing about how we actually achieve that in, in, in practice. Um, but the final thing is just an observation. Um, we established 21 years ago 250 odd hectares of montane woodland um, on our farms at Kirkton Octotire, specifically with the aspiration to actually introduce a, a pastoral graze, silvo pastoral grazing system. Um, 21 years down the line, those trees haven't grown enough in order to actually allow us to put the livestock back in. So we just need to manage expectations about, as I said in my presentation, what type of trees we're putting where and for what purpose um, um, in order to do that. So you did mention uplands in your in your question, Stephen. So it, it's just, uh, we just need to be careful actually what we're doing where um, and, and how long we expect then that outcome to be achievable. Um, Again, I, to see, Susie? I think it comes back to um, the right place, the right type, because I'm in completely the opposite situation. I put trees in 15 years ago and you know my hands are going to be tied for another 15 years before I can do anything with them. Who is talking about nitrous oxide emissions and why um, so much attention has been given to methane um, rather than nitrous oxide, and particularly the application of fertilizers. Um, Stevie, I, I don't know if you want to, to answer that or if that's one more for one of the others. Stevie, are you happy to answer that one? Yeah, well, as much as I know about the science, I'm an economist after all. Um, <clears throat> yeah, as far as I understand, the well, there's always tension when it comes to uh, methane, short-lived gas. Nitrous oxide is a longer-lived gas, has got much greater uh, global warming potential. Uh, quite a lot of our uh, nitrous oxide emissions actually come from manure and the way we handle manure from livestock as well. So it's when you actually start working out the actual point source of some of these, then uh, whilst it might be some of the, the applications in terms of inorganic fertilizers onto, onto soils, they also are getting, uh, are, are increasingly be focused on. Uh, the, the, the whole tillage question is going to be, going to be come into sharp focus uh, in the next 10 years as people have to actually uh, address what what the carbon contents of soils are and how to actually grow soils, and then the re, in the the sort of whole um, 
discourse within Scottish Government just now, the regenerative agricultural principles of actually growing your soil carbon and growing the soil depth uh, is coming into sharp focus as well. So I don't think it's fair to say that they're not focusing on these. Uh, it just seems to be that methane gets the biggest attention. Uh, and it's simply because, uh, certainly from a Scottish perspective, it is, is, a, it is one of the major contributors uh, to, to, to emissions. Great, thanks, Stevie. And then we'll just take one final question, which is um, from Angela Anderson, where she's talking about decisions being made at local council level, but um, quite often councillors don't don't have a, a huge amount of, of knowledge about it. Do you want to um, elaborate on your question, Angela? I think um, we'll, we'll leave it at that and just uh, maybe pass um, first of all to Mads and then finally to Davey um, for your reflections on, on the role of education for decision makers and as, as well as for, for the wider public. Uh, yeah. Mads first. Yeah. There's, there's definitely, definitely a, a role for, for, for better education of, of decision makers in, in this regard. Uh, to be honest, there's a lot of of decision makers who are hiding away from from the facts in these discussions, I, I I've experienced it myself. Being at the cross party group and 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 saying out some of these things loud can sometimes get uh, your mic muted because it's really inconvenient to hear some of those things. Um, so and that's on a national level, of course. Uh, but I think <clears throat> as a role for education, we should kind of like with, as I said, we have a, we have to have a, a all hands on deck approach. But we can't have a systems change if we don't have a mentality change and a culture change. So we have to have a discussion about that is more fundamentally about what we want and, uh, and have kind of like be mentally prepared for the future being quite different from what we've been used to in the past. And we, can, we have to prepare that decision also educationally. Also with our kind of education in school, etc. On the other hand, I won't force everyone to just, well, we'll just solve it in school because that's not enough either. But hopefully there can be room for, uh, for educating both the young and there will definitely be room for educating the decision makers. I don't think they want education as much. And what, what's been, been going on at the, for instance, at the UN Food Systems Summit that, that was held this, uh, this September, the first time ever, uh, the world leaders got together only to talk about food. In the build-up to that, there was around the world more than a thousand discussions, more than a hundred thousand people involved. So it's not as much this kind of like uh, education as it is just having proper dialogue based on the facts and kind of like making sure that ev everyone at least have access to this kind of information. Because as we can see from these recommendations, as soon as you have all the information there, you can make some really smart. Re, uh, pause recommendations. So there's definitely a room for just breaking the glass bubble that's just been hanging around decision makers uh, uh, around food for uh, way too long. I'm much. I love to go back on the sugar tax, but I've already uh, uh, answered that in chat. Thanks. I'll, I'll pass to Davy. Maybe Davy, I could just ask you to also address the the second question from Stephen, which is asking how we encourage decision makers to engage. So how do we educate them and how do we encourage them to engage? Um, well, I mean, both questions are caught up in the same thing. Um, well, not hopefully it's clear, but it will be clear from what I've said, from what Stephen said, from what Madge has said, even about this, these relatively small areas of important, but still small areas of overall government policy and government interest, that the situation is complex. Um, we've um, we're, we're in a new we've got a new Scottish government. We're in a new Scottish Parliament, um, and that's brought with it, you know, uh, different portfolios for different cabinet secretaries, ministers, etc. Uh, there is no way we can have everything that we need to see going forward all under, you know, the responsibility of one individual cabinet secretary or one individual minister. You know, it's it's it's, it's much too um, holistic and all encompassing for that. So we so we definitely do need to act actually see proper um, and cross-sectoral um, um, understanding and implementation um, of what, we're, uh, what we need to see to address the climate emergency and the biodiversity crisis going forward. 
how we achieve that is a is, is is a bigger question. But actually, getting the getting recognition of that across all sectors of Scottish government in the first instance would be, would be one step towards that. And if they're, they're if they're then constantly being asked to sense check their potential decisions against um, um, uh, the impact it would actually have on um, both the climate emergency and 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 biodiversity crisis, that would be that would be a major step forward. It takes leadership. That's the that, that's that's the summary. It takes leadership at uh, at different levels of government and local government to achieve that. Thanks, Davy. So we're now going to move you into breakout rooms for about forty minutes discussion, just under. You don't need to do anything. You will be magically transported to a group, and each group will cover the same question, which is basically what needs to happen next. So just to let you know, we have four illustrators who will join um, four of the groups and they will capture the discussion as it happens but it won't be attributable to any individual so you won't see um, a pen portrait of yourself it will just be the ideas um, which you, you discuss that will be captured in the illustrations and then about um, 20 to 3 we'll come back together again and again that will happen automatically you don't need to worry about it and we'll do a very brief reporting back when you'll also be able to see the work of the illustrators, even if there wasn't one in your group. So just a reminder that in the breakout rooms, you will be asked um, the following question. I'll just pop it in the chat for you. So in the light of, first of all, the assembly's recommendations and what you've heard from our three presenters and the COP26 agreements, which I know were referenced as well, what needs to happen next? Um, so those are the questions to think about in your breakout rooms and you have just under 40 minutes to discuss it. Welcome back. I temporarily dropped out, so I'm not sure whether other people had the same problem just coming back. So we'll, I'll just um, give a moment or two for everybody to make their way back in case they have been thrown out in the process. And then we'll go around each of the breakout rooms. And can I ask you just to give your headline one or two priority next steps um, and very short reporting back from the facilitators. Um, we'll then um, also see the illustration that the um, those who've had an illustrator in their group um, have as well. So I'll start off um, with Davy's group who has the illustrator Alice in um, his group. And David, do you want to just report back a little on what your group discussed? So um, just to say, through the uh, my group then ended up uh, being merged with the group facilitated by Rob McMoran, and, and Rob led on the facilitation of that. But Alice was in that group, so but I'll leave Rob and Jane to to feed back there, and Alice to present um, the illustrations that she was doing there. So excellent, thank you, Rob. Do you want to feed back? Can can we see Alice's screen? So it's, I think it's me feeding back. It's Jane uh, from that group. Um, <laughs> uh, thanks, Susie. Thanks, Davey. Um, so the, the two, um, we, we sort of had four priorities amongst the group and, and honed in on two. The first of which was the importance of engaging and uh, educating decision makers. Um, and we talked a little bit about different types of decision makers, different stakeholders, and the need to engage with them um, in different ways, whether it be communities or politicians, um, and the need to target people effectively. One thing we talked about was the use of pilots, uh, and not just uh, pilot farms, but uh, much broader projects, multiple objectives. Um, and the second thing was um, the need to join up the recommendations. Obviously, there's lots of recommendations in the assembly report, um, but the need to try and somehow succinctly bring them together to a, to a sort of smaller uh, group of recommendations. And one way to do that might be to prioritize in terms of what needs to happen short short run, medium run, long run, or what needs to happen really now, um, taking into account time lag and, and uh, the sort of, um, yeah, the, the, the lag in terms of the timing for things to actually happen, whether it's growing trees or restoring peatlands. Um, and I'll stop there. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jane. It sounds like you've had a very constructive um, conversation. And thank you very much, Alice, for sharing um, the illustrations. They look great. So just to note that we will circulate these illustrations around to everybody who's joined the, the call so you get to see um, them in their full glory. I'll move on to the group with Scott and Charlotte in. 
I'm not sure whether it's going to be Scott or Charlotte who's going to report back. It's going to be me, Susie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just, um, so the first point that was spoken about was the need to change the way that we educate people surrounding carbon sequestration and land management, um, and particularly the need to stimulate knowledge exchanges. Um, regarding who would be involved, um, it was spoken about that this is key at all levels of education. Um, in terms of when, um, the key point was made that there might be a need to focus on low-hanging fruits because although there's a lot that we don't know, we also don't have a lot of time to find it out at the moment. Um, and why? To fund and disseminate accurate knowledge, particularly regarding carbon. Um, at present, we lack a methodology that links practices like tree planting um, to things like carbon emissions. Um, and how? Um, Government-funded research on topics provided by land managers and farmers. Um, another key point was stressed that, that um, ideally it would be bottom-up processes and there'd be a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning involved. The second point that we spoke about was baselining in terms of carbon sequestration and biodiversity. Um, baselining surveys are important, but they're very expensive. One example that was given was £140 per soil samples. So there's a lot of risk involved in land managers and farmers here. Um, and a way to mitigate that was to introduce financial systems where they don't already exist to facilitate farmers being able to um, conduct base, baseline surveys of their, their lands, essentially. Um, without that investment, it's too risky for farmers to make the required shift in focus. Um, two potential solutions, the Scottish National Investment Bank was mentioned and an agro-economic development bank that already exists was spoken about as well. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. I'm going to pass now to Mads, who has the illustrator Jenny um, with him. Mads, do you want to feed back? Yes, thank you. Yeah, we, had, we, we did cheat a little bit because we talked about three things. Uh, but I think the, the most important perhaps was to um to see okay talk about a balanced approach to land management and food production in the in scotland but in that balance maybe also acknowledge some kind of of rebalance but we need a nuanced debate so we won't Miles, you're just breaking up a little can you just try with your microphone again Oh, sorry, that, can you hear me? Yes, that's better, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so we need a rebalanced approach and have honest discussion about what could the future of kind of like Scottish uh, food landscape look like? Do we produce the thing that's relevant for the future markets at the moment? If not, should we start changing? Not radical changes and acknowledging where we come from, but a slight change in, in, in what we do and also embrace new forms of production, such as, for instance, urban farming, kind of like a landscape food production side of thing. Metrics, as you've all touched upon, was something that we also talked about, but we also talked a lot about uh, public procurement and the role the public procurement can have uh, a little bit about we, 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 need to, uh, we need to have a new vision for what can be can be done, it it can be important to have public procurement work also as a vehicle for local innovation. So it's not just because the public procurement can lower greenhouse gas emissions, but it can also stimulate local growth, local innovation, local kind of like, as we heard about pilots. So can we spend the public money a little bit smarter in order to produce the future food for the futures? And then yeah, as as mentioned, metrics. We need as good metrics as we can, but we can't let the let the perfect be the enemy of the good when it comes to metrics. So we, we want some labeling. We want something to happen when it comes to guiding us, taking the right choices. Thank you so, so much for the, uh, for the illustration. I think that's Excellent. it for me. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to pass now to the group with um, Karen, Nick, Alexa, and the illustration Jules in it. And I think Nick is going to try and report back Although um, I know there's been some mic problems, so let's just try with Nick. Yeah, is my mic working now? Now yes. I can't. Yes, is it working? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. I don't know what what's not agreeing the the computer or our Scott system. 
not sure. But yeah, we, we had a really engaged um, conversation that covered a lot of ground. So I'll try to do it justice by going over a few points then in combination with the illustration. So I felt like people felt very strongly about the need for fair assessments before any of the regulations or subsidies or even taxes come into play, that there needs to be a fair system to assess um, up and down the supply chain. So not only a point of consumption or a point of production, but across the whole um, supply chain. And that needs to be done transparently. And ideally, there would be standardization of this process as well, because otherwise there'd just be too many competing bodies and interest groups that meddle with that. And in order to achieve any of this, I felt like there was also um, a desire to have overarching decision making bodies that and actually engage people so that there's not an unfair situation where some collectives will have very well connected and educated members and then others who don't really know how to work with um, these regulations. So I think that that um, sort of summarizes a lot of the points and then I think the brilliant illustration can do the rest for that. Thank you very much indeed and thank you very much to Jules for a fantastic illustration and finally um, to the group with um, Stephen who had Rosie as the illustrator in that group. Stephen do you want to report back and Rosie to show you? Yeah hi um, we had a, a sim similarly diverse set of discussions where um, we talked about a lot about a number of different things rather than focusing in on uh, two absolute priorities. But it actually boiled down to probably local food and um, sort of the, the Soil Association's Food for Life campaign and how to get local food and connecting with food and local food and sustainable food at school level that then actually stimulates the next generation of consumers to actually be, be make better choices about where they source food, the type of food they're sourcing, etc. Uh, we also picked up on the, the local procurement uh, aspects of that, um, that that Mads talked about. And there are actually local authorities where uh, small scale producers are actually able to get into the procurement system uh, already. Um, and that, that, that's important. We did talk quite a bit about how do you change consumption? And it was interesting to hear from Susie about the, the assembly and, and they, were, they were concerned about uh, equitable uh, solutions and that if we simply just change production and stopped production of a, a product, then uh, and lead and that led to to simply offshoring of it, of production and emissions, then that, that wasn't really what they were getting at. And when we considered sort of the the beef system, um, we we kind of I was I was making the point that we're we're a huge huge as a UK, we're a huge uh, net importer of beef. Um, Yet Scotland is a massive net exporter of ruminant livestock to the rest of the UK and abroad. So, so Scotland's in this strange fluxy position. But then we also had a discussion that uh, it's frustrating that with beef and meat, it's binary. Uh, there's, the, the debate is often binary in that they, they're, they're bad for the environment, yet they have very positive outcomes in terms of grassland sequestration, but also in terms of biodiversity in, in some areas where there's limited choice for economic activity. Um, and then I suppose the, the, the other thing that we talked about was mandatory food labeling um, and the need for change there. So we, we had a very probably consumptive uh, approach to this rather than the productive approach, uh, probably, probably because we, we were recognizing that actually, if you really want to change production, you actually have to change uh, consumption first. Great, thank you and very much. Thanks for the illustrations. Yeah, I was just going to say fantastic illustrations from Rosie. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you to everybody and for your contributions and to the facilitators for feeding back. And we're now going to ask Professor Wayne Powell, Principal and Chief Executive of SRUC, to make some closing remarks. Wayne. Yeah, thanks, Susanna. Really, really enjoyed um, the session. I've really enjoyed um, listening, learning more about the work of the assembly, and also the hearing, obviously, from uh, Davy, Mads, and Stephen. And I think there's a couple of things maybe I could um, 
refer to um, with respect to each of those presentations. I mean, I think the point from, from Davy, which was quite startling, was around the concrete industry. And uh, are you right on this, Davy, in terms of the third highest emitter in the world? I'm going to sort of follow up on that just to, to, to check that out. But it's a staggering statistic. But behind it, I think I just wondered if there was really a, a, a need for us to really re revisit um, the lignocellulose as a, as a nature-based solution and the importance of that in terms of really uh, providing new opportunities going forward. As, uh, Stevie, in terms of your presentation, again, you know, a uh, huge amount of, of, um, uh, of gathering of data and presentation of that data, particularly uh, striking again around methane, but again, you pointed out the opportunity for innovation in terms of really reducing methane em uh, emissions from, from ruminants and the role of both uh, uh, microbial interventions together with, um, with genetics. Mads, I sensed uh, a sense of frustration with uh, COP26 and food. Kind of interesting that uh, Dimbleby report on, on food didn't appear, I think, in, uh, in, COP, um, in COP26. I'm not sure if, that's, if I'm correct on that. But certainly, I think the points that you are making around a systems-based approach is so important, and, 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 and the requirement for that systems-based approach to, um, to be embedded in evidence uh, uh, creation and delivery. I, too, love the illustrators. Thank you so much. I hope we can have an opportunity to use that uh, within SIUC as well. And the reason is that when you see some of these illustrations, you see patterns emerging. And some of these patterns emerging become so important to us as human beings to support creativity. Um, so um, really, really thoroughly enjoyed the day. Thank you very much for the contributors to the, and to the, to the um, uh, participants. Uh, if SIUC can help any further in terms of facilitation, I'm sure Jane and colleagues would be very happy to do that. And I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, participating in this afternoon session. So thank you so much. I'm going to turn to you now, Susie. Thank you very much, Wayne, and um, huge thanks for, for all the support um, from yourself and also from the three speakers, David McCracken, Stephen Thompson and Maz Fisher Waller. Thank you to the illustrators um, for presenting the um, conversations in such an engaging way, but also to the participants for sharing your ideas with us. And if you're um, interested to take this conversation forward, then there are a couple of things you can do. I'm just going to very briefly share my screen again. Um, so first of all, you can join with over 100 other organisations from the Soil Association to the Joint Europe Trust, to the Woodland Trust and many other agencies and businesses to, um, let me just move this forward, so those are some of the organisations that have already assigned for Scotland, which is Scotland's Civic Charter, which supports the Assembly's recommendations. So if you've been inspired by what the Assembly has said, and you want to indicate your organisation's support, then please do use the hashtag Sign for Scotland and contact us about the Civic Charter. We would be delighted to have you sign up. If you would like to be involved in further discussions on the topics, um, SIUC will be in touch after the event to let you know about how you can do that. And I know they're very keen to continue these conversations, um, particularly along the lines of the speakers. Um, so I will stop sharing my screen now and just um, say thank you very much indeed to everybody for joining us. I hope you found it as interesting and engaging and inspiring as I have. And we'll be in touch after the event with um, copies of the illustrations and ideas about what you can do next. Have a good afternoon.